offer my most loving pranams at Swami's lotus feet. I pray to Swami that He gives all of us the understanding. It is Swami who speaks and it is Swami who listens through each one of us. Elders, sisters and brothers, Sairam to all of you. Uh, a warm good afternoon. It is indeed my pleasure to be here once again and take this opportunity to stand and think about Swami, to speak about Him. And as I always maintain, the first beneficiary of an exercise such as this is myself. It is Swami's immense love and grace that He has given me this role, this small role to play in this beautiful interaction between Him and His loved ones. And it is very special to be here in Melbourne because I come from Radio Sai and Radio Sai has a interesting connection with Melbourne. The year 2001 when Swami inaugurated the Radio Sai broadcast, I don't know how many of you are aware that uh, during Swami's birthday celebrations there was a button which was placed on Swami's table. So Swami was supposed to press the button and the first broadcast of Radio Sai Global Harmony was supposed to begin. When Swami pressed the button, what actually happened was, in the bhajan hall was one of the members of that team who made a phone call to Melbourne. And it was from Melbourne the uplink happened. So Melbourne is the place from where Radio Sai was broadcast for the first time. I don't know how many of you are aware of that. And that was again heard in Sai Kulwant Hall and Swami was welcomed in the first broadcast of Radio Sai Global Harmony. So it's a full circle, I've come back here. I, I was a student then, sitting in the audience. I didn't know I would become a member of the team. Eventually I did. And now I'm here, the place where it all began. Right? So it is wonderful to be here with all of you this evening. The past couple of days has been beautiful. The past couple of weeks has been wonderful for me in remembering and retelling the beautiful stories of Bhagwan. Sometime in the 50s, Swami called some of the devotees and Swami asked them, for this year's Vijay Dashmi, what is the special program? I think it must have been the year 57 or 58 or roundabouts. So Swami asked, what is the special program that we are having for Vijay Dashmi? So different suggestions were made. Swami, we can call so-and-so, he's a good singer. Swami, we can have a drama, we can have this program and that program. Then one of them suggested, Swami, I know of a person who does burakata very well. Burakata is a traditional uh, art form of Andhra Pradesh. So there is this person, he is very, very famous. In fact, uh, he gets invited all around the country to perform this burakata, this traditional art form. Maybe we can try calling him, right? His name was, I think, uh, Achyutaramaya. He was apparently very, very famous at that point in time. The moment his name was mentioned, said, Swami, this Achyutaramaya Garu is there, we could probably invite him. And Swami said, yes, I want him. <laughs> Swami said, yes, I want him to be the person who performs during the Vijayadashmi. The person who suggested the name then became a little nervous. He said, Swami, because he's very famous, I'm not too sure whether he'll be available because it's too short a notice. And Swami says, I don't know what you will do. I want him. I want him to perform. So this man said, yes, Swami, I will try my best. So he goes back to his native place and then tries to reach out to this Mr. Achyutaramaya. And uh, he is totally unaware about Swami, doesn't have any clue where Puttaparthi is, who Satisai Baba is. 
So when he is asked, will you be willing to perform, he said, well, I am a performer, so if you want me to perform, I will perform. So when do you want me to come? And they said, uh, this year is Vijay Dashmi. Is this some kind of a joke? He asked. Do you even know how busy I am? And Vijay Dashmi is just a you know, month away. And that's one of the times which, which I'm always invited everywhere. So I'm completely booked. I can't go to this place which no one has heard, Puttaparthi. So they, they'll see, they're saying that, you know, Swami was so particular that he wanted to come. They said, we'll see how it works out. And we all know how it works out, right? In the next few days, some of his shows were cancelled, some of his performances were postponed, and suddenly Vijay Dashmi was free for him. So he reaches out to this devotee and he says, looks like I'm free now, so I can come for Vijay Dashmi. So, all right. So they take him to Puttaparthi. He's not too impressed by the plays, he's not too impressed by, uh, you know, all of these people being so uh, excited about this young boy. So Swami calls him for an interview and Swami asks him, so what are you going to perform tomorrow? So he gives a list of kathas that he has done. Swami is Subhash Chandra Bose. Swami Ravana and something, some Kumbhakarana's fight and uh, you know the killing of this Asura. And Swami told him, Vijay Dashmi is such an auspicious day, don't you have anything auspicious? Everything is about wars and killing and he said, Swami, nowadays people want to hear only this, so I keep performing only this. Swami said, no, no, in Puttaparthi I don't want, I want something auspicious. So this man says, <coughs> Swami, many years ago I have done a burrakata on Parvati Kalyanam. And Swami says, yes, that is a good topic, you can do on that. This man says, but Swami, it's been a while, I don't remember it completely, but I'll see. That night this man goes to sleep in Puttaparthi. The entire script of Parvati Kalyanam which he had written many years ago was coming in front of him in the dream. Right, line by line, so clearly it comes in front of him in that dream. The next morning he wakes up and he completely remembers the whole thing. But he can't go and tell that this is the dream I had, right? So he goes to Swami and says, yeah, now I can, you know, I think I've recollected whatever I had done many years ago, I can do it now. Swami doesn't say anything, Swami says, good, Manchidi. So you do that. So he performs, he performs that entire Burrakata, everyone is enthralled because he is a professional, he is a, he's very good at his art. At the end of it, Swami blesses him with the usual uh, gifts that he blesses him, blesses artists with clothes and uh, whatever is the you know, respects that are paid to an artist who performs. At the end of it, Swami tells him, I will give you prasadam, you wait. And then the other functions continue. This man comes backstage, he says, what prasadam I have to wait for? He has given me the money, he has given me whatever gifts he has to give, I am leaving. Right? He says, I don't need any prasadam, what will I do with prasadam? So he goes back to his hometown and one day he is sitting in the, uh, the portico of his house and this man had this uh, problem of very acute asthma attacks. So that day as he was uh, sitting there, he suddenly has this acute attack of asthma, he is not able to breathe, he is gasping and it is so bad that he is not even able to call out for help. So he thinks that his last moments have come, right? He thinks that this is it because he's not even able to call out for help. And as he is sitting there in the portico gasping for breath, he hears a voice. The voice says, Achutaramaya, I told you I'll give you prasadam, why did you leave? And he recognizes the voice and the voice continues, no problem. You sit here for a minute and then you go to your room. I have kept prasadam there. I have kept all the prasadam there. And so he calms, him da calms himself down, sits for a while. Then he gets up and he goes to his room in the first floor of his house 
as he reaches his bed, he sees on the bed, Swami has kept vibhuti packets for him. He takes the vibhuti, he consumes a little bit of it. Instantly he feels much better. And now what is there to do but to rush back to Swami and express his gratitude and seek Swami's forgiveness. So he goes back to Swami immediately. And he is, he is so thrilled by this experience of Swami drawing him to himself. And he said, Swami, you should come back to you know, the place he was from, I think it was Rajamandri. So he was saying, Swami, you should come and you should visit all these places. Please come. There are so many people who will benefit if you come. And imagine Swami tells, who knows me there? Nobody knows me there. <laughs> if I come, what will, when people might not come. So this man who is supposed to be the famous artist, he says, Swami, they may not know you, but they know me. He says, I will tell them about my Swami. He says, I will go around telling about my Swami. And for the next few years, he travels extensively in the region of Andhra Pradesh to every town, every village, singing the praises of Swami. To the extent that every village now recognizes Swami. Some of my brothers from the media center, when they went to one of the villages, they were so thrilled to see that every house in that village, on the wall there was a quotation of Swami. Every house of that entire village was resonating with Swami's love, name and message. Because this devotee who was touched said, they may not know you, but they know me and so they will know you. One of the most beautiful quotes I had come across a long time ago is, if people know you and don't know God, people should know God because they know you. Live your life in such a way. And I think that is the opportunity that Swami has given all of us. That is a small opportunity that Swami has given individuals like myself. Not to speak about Him. We don't stand here to glorify Him. We don't stand here to spread His message and spread His name. We are here to speak about what has touched us. I am here to speak about what has moved me and what probably attracts all of you to it is it is the same Lord who has loved you, the same Lord who is loving you, who has moved you. But this idea that here I am spreading Swami's name and spreading Swami's message uh, is a thought that can be anything but intelligent. Oftentimes when we travel from Prashantanilyam and go around places, people would ask us, you know, generally, oh, where do you come from? So you will wonder, should I say Puttaparthi? Will they know Puttaparthi? Because if you tell Puttaparthi, you have to say, you know, Satisai Baba's ashram. Will they know? Will they be able to relate to it? So sometimes you will say, you know, it's a place close to Bangalore. <laughs> you will say it's down south, somewhere in Andhra Pradesh. There is a discourse that Swami was once delivering and Swami said, there are some people who will come to Puttaparthi for darshan. When they go back, people in their office will ask them, where did you go? You are not here for a few days. And they will say, we went to Bangalore and came. And Swami went on to say, you do not hesitate to say when you go for a movie. You do not hesitate to say that you did this, you did that when it is nothing worthwhile to talk about, but you are embarrassed to say that you have come to Puttaparthi? Are you embarrassed to say that you came to have Swami's darshan? So, from then, you know, at least I would think that anybody asks me where are you from, I'll say I'm from Puttaparthi. What is, what is wrong in that? And I would think at least that way, people will hear the name Puttaparthi, if not anything else. At least once, let the name of this holy land fall upon the ears. A few years ago, we were, me and a few of my friends were traveling to 
the northern part of India, we were in the state of Sikkim, we were going towards this place called the Nathula Pass, right? That's supposed to be the border of India and China. And being a very sensitive area, you, you need to take a lot of government passes before you're able to go to that place. And the people who are arranging the trip, they said, you know, you can get all the passes, but still suddenly the police might close down uh, that region. You may not be able to go there or suddenly they might stop the vehicle. So they said, just be prepared for it. If you're allowed to see, then you can see and come. And he said, all right. So we were going in this vehicle towards that Natula Pass and a policeman stopped the car. And he said, oh God, we're in problem now. Will we be allowed to go or not? So we lowered the window, we asked him, what is it? And the policeman said, sir, I have duty at the pass. Would you mind if I get into the car and you can drop me off there? And he said, all right, why not? So he jumped into the car and as expected, he looked at us and he asked, where are you all from? So this thought, right? Let him hear the name of Puttaparthi from my, you know, I am, I am giving him the blessing of hearing about Puttaparthi. I didn't think like that, but somewhere, you know, all these thoughts will be there, right? So I told him, have you heard of Puttaparthi? We are coming from there. And the next thing this man says is, Sairam sir. <laughs> He says, Sairam sir, I am just coming back from Prashanti Nilayam Seva. He says, I have just finished Sevadal duty in Prashanti Nilayam and I am just coming back to join my duty as a policeman at the Nathula Pass. So sometimes when we think too much of ourselves, that here I am carrying Swami's message, here I am spreading the name of Swami, Swami, I think, reminds us that he doesn't need us for him to spread his name, his message and his glory. There were a few devotees of Swami who were doing a lot of seva and relief activities in a war-torn region. So they had been to this, this uh, city called Samarkand in Uzbekistan. So a war-torn region, there was always a lot of need for people to come and help them. So they had taken a lot of food supplies, they had taken doctors with them, medicines with them. So they, they thought to themselves, look, this is a, you know, a country which has predominantly Muslim population and let us not really talk about Swami. We will go do Swami's work. If anyone asks us, we will tell them that we come from Swami's organization. So, so that there is no problem and there is no discomfort in the whole thing. So they all decide, we say, okay, we will not tell anyone, we will not put Swami's photograph anywhere, we will just do Swami's work. So they go and they indulge themselves in seva. After about a few days, one Muslim lady comes up to these doctors and she asks them, where are you from? You are doing such selfless work, you are helping all of us. Where are you from and who has sent you? So they said, okay, we said if someone asks, we will tell. So they take out a small photograph of Swami, probably one of those pocket calendars that we've seen. And they show it to this lady and say that he is our master, he has sent us here. And the moment that lady sees that photograph, she bursts into tears and she says, He is God. He is our God. We know Him. And this group was stunned. They said, how do you know Him? He says, because He keeps coming here to comfort us. We've all seen Him multiple times. And as they were conversing with this old lady, one of the children who were playing around comes and looks over the shoulder of these people who are playing and looks at Swami's photograph and says, Oh, he was here last evening playing soccer with us. <laughs> when we think that we are carrying Swami's name and we are doing Swami's work, I think every now and then Swami reminds us that He actually doesn't need any of us 
to do that, right? You look around in Prashantinilyam, you have multiple institutions, you have Swami running a university, Swami running hospitals, a general hospital, a super hospital, a mobile hospital. But when you ask this question, that does he really need to run any of these institutions at all? Does he need a hospital to heal? Does he need a university to teach? There was this doctor who was working in Swami's hospital. The story was told by another doctor. <clears throat> so this doctor was working in Swami's hospital and all of a sudden he started feeling a little unwell. He started becoming very weak. So they decided to do, run a few tests on him. And when they ran the tests, they found out that he was a bit anemic. Right? His uh, RBCs were low or whatever was the condition. So then they said, let's do a proper thorough checkup and let's see what could be wrong. Is there any other problem? So they found out that there was an internal bleeding somewhere in the intestine or something. Some hemorrhage was there because of which he was constantly losing blood and he was becoming anemic. So they said, you know, the best... Uh, diagnosis, I mean the best medication for that is you give some blood thickening medicine so that at least the hemorrhage ceases to a certain extent. But when they run the other tests, they found that he also has a block in the heart. Well now the treatment for a block in the heart is blood thinning. So if they give him a blood thickening medicine, the block is going to become bad. So if they give him a blood thinning medicine, the hemorrhage is going to become bad. So they didn't know what had to be treated first and how to go about the treatment. And the doctors would say, whenever they have any such tricky cases, the only worthwhile thing to do is go and tell Swami, Swami, this is the problem. And that's precisely what they did. They went and informed Swami that this doctor is not keeping well and this is the tricky scenario that they are faced with. Swami said, all right, I will come and see him. Swami says, I will come to the hospital and I will see him. So the next day, Swami comes to the hospital, goes to the ward where this doctor is admitted, speaks to him and materializes vibhuti and gives it to that doctor and says, you take this, maybe Swami had told three times a day, take it for three days or whatever Swami had told him. Swami comes out and calls these other doctors and Swami tells them, I have given him vibhuti between the heart block and the hemorrhage. You choose which one you want to treat, the vibhuti will take care of the other. He says between the block in the heart and the hemorrhage that is happening, you choose what you want to treat, my vibhuti will take care of the other. The question again is, does he need a hospital? Does he need doctors to serve him in an institution like that? There was this student of Swami who was not keeping quite well. And again, he was becoming very weak. He was not able to participate in sports. So the teachers took him to the hospital, Swami's super specialty hospital and got him tested and they found that he has a heart condition which needed to be operated upon. So Swami was informed that Swami the student is not keeping well. So then Swami took over, you know, Swami was very concerned about the student. Swami was monitoring what he was eating. He called the doctors and he asked them their opinion, what are they planning to do? So the doctors told Swami we need to do a surgery. Then Swami tells that, see, let the surgery be done during the summer when the boy is having his vacations so that his study doesn't get, his studies don't get uh, disturbed. And Swami arranges for everything, the date is fixed, the parents have been called and because it was summer time, Swami goes away to Kodakanal. Right? And Swami has given all the instructions to the doctors what has to be done and Swami goes away to Kodakanal 
And one day Swami is sitting in Kodekanal with all the other students around him. <clears throat> and Swami is talking to them very casually. And suddenly Swami becomes very pensive. And Swami tells the students, one of, one of the students was the classmate of this boy who was going in for the surgery. Swami looked at him and Swami said, Hey, your classmate passed away today. He said, that boy who has gone in for the surgery has passed away today. And instantly gloom set in the whole room. Everyone became very quiet and uh, sad about this news that they were hearing from Swami directly. And Swami was saying, right now, it just happened right now, that they lost him on the operation table. So there was silence for a little while. Everyone was quiet. And suddenly, a beautiful smile came on Swami's face and Swami said, what can happen when I am there with him? Right? Swami gave a beautiful smile and said, what can happen when I am there with him? He's fine now. So they were all very happy. The Kodai session went on as beautiful. And they were all waiting to go back and find out what exactly happened. And so, and so they went to the doctors who were treating this boy and they asked him was the surgery uneventful or is there anything that happened during the surgery so they asked why why are you asking this and then they described that this is the scene that had happened in Kodekanal when Swami was sitting with them and then the doctor said that actually when we were doing the surgery I think it was an open heart surgery or something after the surgery, they are supposed to return the function of the heart from the heart-lung machine to the heart. Right? That's one of the steps they do. You first assign the heart-lung machine to take over the pumping of the heart. You operate upon the heart. And then the heart-lung machine is supposed to transfer the function back to the uh, operated heart. And this doctor was saying that however much we may claim to be doctors and great surgeons and scientists. He says there is no guarantee that we can give that after this the heart will start beating. Maybe 90 out of 100 times it does. But if it doesn't, this doctor said we have no clue why it doesn't and we have no way to make it function normally. They might have some procedures. So they said there is no way <coughs> We can do anything about it if the heart doesn't beat. And they were saying that that day, that's exactly what happened. We finished the surgery and we were trying to transfer the function of the heart from the machine to this human heart and it was not beating. And he said, at that moment, we all dropped our scalpels and equipment down. We turned to the photo of Swami in the operation theater and together we all started chanting Sai Gayatri. And that's precisely the time where, at which Swami was telling in Kodai, this boy has passed away. And after a few brief seconds, Swami said, I am there with him, nothing has happened. So here we see Swami has set up an institution where he has professional doctors. But then the question is, does he really need us? The Lord who can merely by his word, how many are there who, who tell us the stories of Swami said, cancer cancelled and the cancer vanishes. When he heals a heart with a hole without any surgery, we have seen, we have seen, right? We have met people who have had fractures which have healed overnight. We have seen people for whom Swami has performed surgeries in the interview room. We have spoken to such people. But in spite of him being able to do all of this by himself, he creates institutions. He creates opportunities for people like you and me to participate in that work. One of my teachers was narrating this episode to me. He's a 
He's a teacher of chemistry. When he finished his bachelor's, in those days, you had to choose the subject that you're going to major in after you finish your bachelor's. And most of us, whenever we would get this opportunity, we would go and ask Swami. So, Swami, I finished my bachelor's. Uh, which subject should I do my master's in? Generally, if you ask this to our parents, our elders, what will they say? Which subject are you good at? Which subject have you done well in? But with Swami, it's the other way around. Swami will ask, which subject did you get your least marks in? <laughs> and Swami will say, do that. <laughs> Take that subject. So this boy goes and asks Swami, Swami, what should I do? Swami asks him, in your final exam, which subject did you get your least marks in? <laughs> and he says, Swami, chemistry. Take chemistry. <laughs> so that's it. He was stuck in the subject. And he says that he joins for the master's program in chemistry. First thing, he is not able to understand a single concept which is being taught to him in the class. Whatever is being written on the blackboard is Greek and Latin to him. And he's saying that it's, it was horrendous. He could not make anything out of what was being taught. And as though to add insult to injury, he said for some reason the professor just did not like him at all. Every day the class would begin with the professor coming in and pulling him up for some reason or the other, asking him some question. He would cut a sorry figure and then he would get shouted at. And then he would start teaching which he would not understand at all. So it was a nightmare that he was living. That, and you know, he was wondering, I have to study this course for two years and what is going to happen to my career? And all this was going on in his mind. And as though if this was not enough, the professor of the physics department liked him a lot. <laughs> and he was good at physics. The professor of the physics department liked him a lot and uh, he kept saying, why don't you come to my department? Why don't you shift over to my department? So everything was you know, playing about perfectly for him to make that shift. So he decides to write a letter to Swami. He writes a long letter saying, Swami, I'm struggling like this in the chemistry class. I am not able to do this. I'm not able to do that. The teacher doesn't like me. I don't like the teacher. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know what exactly he wrote. So he wrote all those and gave the letter to Swami. Swami goes through the letter, calls him inside the interview room. And Swami asks, what is your problem? What are you cribbing about? So again, he pours out the whole thing. Swami, I don't understand what is being taught. I, teacher doesn't like me. Please, Swami, please permit me. I'll shift to the physics department. It's still early in the course. So if you permit me, I'll shift to the physics department. Swami said, it's after all a subject, after all chemistry, why do you have to get so worked up about that? He says, Swami, it's, it's a big deal, right? For us, when we are studying, it's a big deal. At that moment, it seems like that's the most important thing in the whole world. But Swami was telling him, it's after all a subject, you'll do well. But he said, no, no, Swami, I'm not able to. And Swami, at the end of it, Swami says, okay, come here. So he goes up to Swami. And Swami, Swami gives him a resounding pat on his head. That he says, go, everything will be fine. <laughs> this boy is like, Swami, what? Everything will be fine. I have to go back to the chemistry class now. Swami says, go, everything will be fine. And he says he goes back, the first chemistry class he sits in, miraculously he is able to understand every concept that is being taught. Suddenly everything makes sense. If you think that is the greatest miracle, no, the professor starts liking him <laughs> and he says that's a greater miracle. <laughs> and within a few days he says i become the most favorite student of the professor and everything makes sense and he suddenly becomes the star student of the whole class and you know swami has a way to really make his mark because eventually he went on to win the young scientist award of the country and all it took was one pat on the head so we would often think, 
tell me we could have had different lines one line for chemistry one line for physics one line for biology we all could have walked up to you and one pat for each one <laughs> it would have saved us so much trouble <laughs> so he who can just grant the knowledge of not any ordinary subject chemistry right i get this so often how did you study chemistry <laughs> because somehow chemistry seems to be so ominous so it's not any ordinary subject that swami transferred knowledge of it was of chemistry right just with a tap just with a touch sometime in the 60s swami was in the city of madras and swami was having a meeting of all the office bearers of the organization at that time very senior office bearers So Swami said, "Let's convene this meeting. I'm in Madras, and most of you are here. So maybe about ten gentlemen, all elderly people. And then Swami started speaking in Telugu, right? Like how he usually does. And one of the elderly people they stopped Swami and said, 'Swami, Swami, I mean, you can't go on in Telugu like this because we have one person who doesn't understand Telugu, right? And he's a very important functionary in the organization.'" he doesn't understand telugu swami so you will have to i will translate whatever you're saying and swami looks around he says only one person doesn't understand the language if you have to translate for him it's unnecessarily you know the waste of time but then they say but swami he has to understand because he is an important member swami says oh is that so and then swami looks at him and says come here <laughs> and the same thing <laughs> one pat on the head so he says ango now we can manage and that man says for the next one hour he understood telugu perfectly like as though it was his own mother tongue so the question is does he really need a university a department that teaches chemistry a department that teaches language when he doesn't need any of us then why does he create institutions why does he give us this opportunity to participate in that work when he doesn't need individuals to go around talking about him to spread his name and glory why does he give individuals like me the opportunity to do that it can only mean that he does not stand to benefit by any of this it can only mean that the individuals who participate in it are there to gain isn't it a few years ago i was doing this program on the radio where we would it was a children's program right so the children's program would have different components we would have storytelling we would have a short conversation with a child we would have some songs sometimes we teach some bhajans so we were doing this program on the radio one time we narrated a story a chinna katha which is quite famous most of you might be aware of it where there is this little boy who has to go to his school crossing a small area of a jungle so he is every time very scared to cross that jungle so he comes back home one day so he comes back home one day and he tells his mother you know mother i'm so scared to go alone like this i don't want to go to school so the mother being a very pious person tells this little boy why do you worry don't you know that you can call out to your elder brother and this boy is surprised he says elder brother i didn't know i have one he says yes the next time when you're crossing the jungle and when you're scared you call out to your elder brother gopala and he will come and he will be your company right and you don't have to be worried or scared about anything so the boy who is so innocent and so sincere the next day when he is scared he calls out to gopala and lord krishna comes in the form of a small boy and walks him to school and thus begins a beautiful relationship between this little boy and lord krishna who comes every day to walk this little boy to school eventually he tells the elders nobody believes the mother who gave him the instruction also doesn't believe 
that actually Krishna is coming and being an, a companion for her child. So that's a Chinakata which Swami says. I'm not completing the Chinakata. So we narrated this story as part of that children's hour program. A few weeks later, we get an email from an excited little boy in the United States. He must have been a seven or eight year old boy. And he writes in that email, I mean, his parents must have written it for him. So the email reads, I really loved that story that you all narrated in the children's hour program. He said, it was so nice. Till there it was fine. Next he said, but I have a few questions. <laughs> And then he lists down the questions. What are the questions? He says, there is no forest near my house. Where should I go and call out? <laughs> and he says, unlike that boy, I go to school by bus. Can I still call out to Krishna? <laughs> and the third question is, I am not the only child of my mother. I have an elder brother and my elder brother keeps bullying me. Can I still call out to Krishna? <laughs> And in all his sincerity, this little boy writes these questions to us. And when we read the email, there was absolutely nothing we could tell in response to that. I mean, we really had nothing to tell. You know, if uh, we will have a question answer session, you will see. When elders ask questions, it's easy to cheat them. <laughs> Can tell something or the other and get away with it. <laughs> but children, when they ask sincerely, it's very, very difficult. You have to be absolutely honest with whatever you say and absolutely clear with what you say. So when me and my colleague, one of my brothers who were doing this program, when we read this email, we actually told each other that only Swami can answer this boy. Right? And we didn't say that with faith, we said it with exasperation. Right? Oh, only Swami can answer this, you know, in that sort of a, uh, emotion. Who can answer all these questions, man? Only Swami can come and answer it. But still, we did make a lame attempt at trying to answer the questions. We didn't get any response from that boy, so we understood that he was not too impressed by the answers. A few months later, we again get an email from the same, the same child. And seeing the number of emojis in that email, you can make out how excited he was. And then he writes, you know, I... Uh, I went to my grandmother's house for my summer vacation and one night when I was sleeping, Swami came into my dream. And the boy says, I was so excited to see Swami and I looked at Swami and said, Swami, have you come to see me? And Swami said, no, no, I have come to answer your questions. <laughs> and then this boy remembers the questions that he had asked us. And he tells Swami, Swami, but I, I didn't ask you that question. I asked the boys at Radio Sai that question. And Swami goes, yeah, yeah, those fellows are useless. They told me only Swami, you can only answer it. <laughs> Swami says, those fellows told that, you know, we cannot answer, only Swami can answer. They are useless fellows, so I have come to answer the questions. And we were eagerly reading that email and the boy says, I got answers to all my questions, Sai Ram. <laughs> So till today we don't know what those answers were, <laughs> but he got his answers, he was completely satisfied and here we were thinking that we are answering questions, we are spreading Swami's name. Does really Swami need an institution like Radio Sai or Media Center or the Book Trust or anything for that matter? Does he need an organization? Does he need centers? But in spite of it, if he has created an infrastructure such as this, it can only mean that there is something that we benefit by participating in that, isn't it? There is absolutely nothing that Swami can gain from it. When Swami came to inaugurate the media center, the building, Swami made it absolutely clear. He said, there is nothing for me to gain from this. Right? He said it. He said, there is nothing for me to gain from this institution. But if it will make devotees happy, I allow it. Right? I foster it. 
As long as it benefits devotees, Swami said, I am happy to bless it. Right? Because there is absolutely nothing that I can say, I can do, and what, what can I glorify him? What can you glorify him? Right? I probably will conclude with another very beautiful episode which a senior of mine narrated. We all know about Swami's water projects, right? So, anyone knows which was the first water project? First place where Swami did water project? Sorry? No? Sorry? Anantapur, right? Anantapur was the first water project that Swami did. Second one? That's more tricky. Okay, I'll tell you how the second one came to be the second water project. So Swami had completed the Anantapur water project. The people who had worked for the water project, there was an engineer by name Kondal Rao, there was a, the, the chief of the, the uh, construction company, Mr. Ramakrishna, great devotees of Swami, they were all in Swami's presence. And there was another student who was a senior of mine who was also in that interview. So Swami was, you know, it was a review meeting of the Anantapur water project. So Swami was asking, is everything going fine? Is everything happening? At the end of it, Swami asked, so where shall we do the next water project? Right? Swami is asking, where shall we do the next water project? And Swami is asking, Mr. Ramakrishna, you have any idea? He said, no, Swami, wherever you say. Swami looks at Mr. Kundal Rao. He also says, Swami, you tell us, Swami, you instruct us, we'll do. Swami turns to this student who was there and Swami asks him, where shall we do the next water project? And this student looks at Swami and says, Swami, Medak. He says, Medak. And as he says, he's thinking in his mind, what a weird name. I've never heard that before. <laughs> Imagine that boy is saying that, Swami, we will do it in the district of Medak. And as he is saying it, he is thinking in his mind, I have never heard that name before. I have never heard that and what a weird name for a place. And then Swami says, ah, that's a good suggestion. Let's do it in Medak district. <laughs> and that is how that came to be the second phase of Swami's water project. Imagine if somebody had seen that scene, they would have thought, okay, here is that person who initiated that water project, his suggestion. We all are there around Swami, just making ourselves available to Him, right? So that He picks up each one of us and uses us in this mission. There is a great benefit to each one of us in our spiritual journey to be an instrument of the Lord, right? Knowing well, being in that complete awareness that he doesn't require me, he doesn't require an institution, he doesn't require my efforts, but still participating in the work with the thought that I am merely an instrument. Right? As Krishna instructed Arjuna, Nimitta Matram Bhavasavya Sachi, he says, O oh Arjuna, be Nimitta matram, be an instrument alone. And in that lies your redemption, in that lies your freedom. So this was the topic on which I thought we can deliberate upon a little more. Maybe after the tea break we can talk about it a little more. Uh, I know it is not very theoretical. I'm consciously not making it very message heavy. Somebody, I was instructed, we want more stories. And I said, I could not be happier. There is nothing more beautiful than merely listening to the stories of Swami, immersing ourselves in the stories of Swami. And as we do that, pray to Swami that all of these become a part of our thinking, right? Part of our understanding of what we are supposed to do with this life. 
because if it is only to listen and be entertained then the benefit will be only from the beginning of the session till the end of the session but if we choose that all of these stories and all of these bhagavatam that we constantly hear becomes like seeds that are sown in our consciousness then we will grow with that seed that is sown right and for that swami would often say you know this seed cannot be sown in any soil it has to be sown in soil that is suitable for that and it has to be watered this the soil that is suitable is the soil is the heart which already has that love and devotion for swami and the watering that is required swami says is again the love for swami and then this seed that is sown will grow and with it will grow our devotion with it will grow our understanding and we will move towards that ultimate goal right so with these thoughts i'll conclude this particular portion